An extremely common occurrence in deep learning is that we find ourselves wanting to solve some problem that we know deep learning is good at, but we also know that training a deep model requires an enormous amount of data, and for our particular problem, we have nowhere near enough. This comes up with all kinds of different problems and all kinds of neural network architectures. But for now, let's think about the case of an image processing task with a convolutional network where our image data set is relatively small. But keep in mind that the ideas will translate to many other domains. We know that deep convolutional networks are good at image processing, but if we were to train a deep convolutional network on a small set of images, we would expect extreme overfitting where the network basically just memorizes the input data. In such cases, we need to either find some way to make better use of our data or find other data we can use. And if we can collect a larger data set for our problem, we totally should. But if we can't, we can turn to data augmentation and transfer learning. Transfer learning is one of the most important ideas in modern deep learning, and yet it's remarkably simple to explain. The core concept is that we will train a deep neural network on some related but more general problem than the one we're trying to solve, and then we'll just reuse that pre-trained network with a bit more training on our data set to solve our problem. In an image processing setting, we could train a network on large image data sets that have been scraped from the web or compiled for various machine learning competitions. And a network trained on those data sets would have a last layer that's used for performing classification on those types of images. So now, if we're doing some other image processing task with a different sort of output layer, we could throw away the outputs of this network but take the rest of the network and add our own output layer. So we can choose an output layer shape that matches the problem we're trying to solve, such as the number of labels we want our classifier to output. And adding this new layer will mean adding new weights that connect it back to the last layer of the pre-trained network. And so those weights will require training, and we can train them using our small data set. So at this point, it's reasonable to ask why we would expect this to work. Well, the hope is that if the problem we did our pre-training on is similar enough that it would share functionality with our problem, then much of that functionality will transfer over when we preserve most of the network. One way to think about what's going on is that if we pre-trained on a generic image processing task, and now we want to solve a smaller, specific image processing problem, these two different image processing problems, if we were to solve them by hand, would probably use some of the same libraries for basic functionality. And so we might hope that the large neural network for the generic problem would along the way learn some generic image processing functions that we can then take advantage of when we train a little bit on our specific problem. Or another perspective for thinking about what's going on here is that if we have one dense layer at the end of the network that's performing classification, we know that each neuron in that layer is computing a relatively simple function of whatever it received from the previous layer. And so the pre-trained network must have done some pretty substantial transformations on the input data to arrive at something that we could then do a simple processing on at the end to produce the classification or other result of the pre-training. And so we could think of all of these previous layers as a type of input transformation, a much more advanced version of giving a linear model quadratic inputs, 
where what all of these layers have learned to do is transform input images into something that can be easily classified. And so we can think of transfer learning as applying this learned transformation to our small data set and then learning how to go from the transformed inputs to the outputs for our problem. When doing transfer learning, we generally have some options for how to use the pre-trained model. We definitely have to throw away its output layer because the outputs need to match up with our problem. But if we wanted, we could also throw away other layers of that model if we think that the useful pre-processing has been done earlier in the network. And if we wanted to, we could add on multiple layers to do more sophisticated processing of the training that we're doing for our problem. Another option that's available to us, which can help ensure that any useful processing these early layers are doing gets preserved is when we are retraining, we could explicitly freeze the weights on those earlier layers. This is especially useful if the pre-trained model had an enormous data set and our problem has a very small data set, in which case it's unlikely that we'll get substantial improvement to those early layers from training on our little bit of data. So now, whenever we're solving a problem on a small data set, but there exist models trained on related data sets, we should consider applying transfer learning. And all of the deep learning libraries we've encountered have what are known as model zoos for facilitating transfer learning. A model zoo is a collection of pre-trained models for different types of problems that you can try out as a starting point for transfer learning when you are solving smaller problems. And this is a huge part of what makes deep learning an accessible tool for solving a wide range of different problems. But sometimes, even with the assistance of transfer learning, our data set isn't big enough to do a good job training a network, even if we're only working on the last few layers. And in that case, we need to think about how can we get as much information out of our data set as possible, which leads us to the idea of data augmentation. The core idea of data augmentation is to apply transformations to the data set that will look different to the neural network, but will mean the same thing to the humans or to whatever system is using the learned model. In the case of image processing, there are a number of different transformations we can apply to an image that will not change a human's perception of what that image represents. For example, if we're classifying an image of an insect, we could rotate the image, and a human looking at the rotated image would still be able to identify what sort of insect is pictured. Likewise, we could zoom in on the image. And crucially, these sorts of transformations mean that the input data being seen by the neural network is substantially different. When we rotate the image, that means that virtually all of the pixel values in the input tensor have been changed. And this will make it much harder for the network to memorize the specific input examples or to rely on fine details of what pixels appear where. But we do have to think about whether the transformations will change the meaning of the data. For example, if we zoom in too far, then it would no longer be possible to identify what insect is in the image. And we have to think about whether the transformations actually look different from the neural network's perspective. For example, if we think about a translation of the image, 
I claim that this transformation doesn't make much difference if we're training a convolutional network. And that's because when we do convolution, the same neuron gets applied to many different subregions of the image, translated across the image by our strides amount, and that tends to make convolutional networks relatively invariant to translations of the input image. And so this is probably a low priority translation that won't make a big difference in the network's ability to generalize. But there are many other ways that we can modify the data, such as adding a little bit of random noise that is not enough to distort how we would perceive the picture. And likewise, we could blur the image slightly so that it's still recognizable. And so as long as any of these transformations are easy to compute, then whenever we're loading in a batch of data, we could choose some random transformations out of this set to apply to each of the input images before we pass that batch of data through the network. And that way, if we train our network for a large number of epochs on our small data set, it won't just be seeing the exact same inputs over and over again and memorizing them. Importantly, none of these data augmentation techniques are anywhere near as good as finding more data to train on, and that includes having related data to use for pre-training, but data augmentation in combination with transfer learning can help us to solve a much wider range of problems using deep neural networks.